So I'm going to be going over your English, which you're going to be studying this book called Silas Marner um, by George Eliot. Now I'll talk a little bit after um, we go over the book who George Eliot is, but I want to tell you there's something very unique about George Eliot. Um, for one thing, George Eliot um, wasn't George, his name was Marianne. Um, because, you know, as she was writing her books and, and she had been um, basically a newspaper reporter way back, we're talking about the 1800s at Westminster Abbey, nobody wanted to read her, read her articles because she was a woman. So she went by an alias of a man's name so that she could write this book and people would read it. And now we find out, we're going to find out a little bit more about Marianne's life. But let's go on with this book. It's a very unique book. book, And you can tell, to me, you can tell it's been written by a woman. Uh, just the way she examines, you know, when she go, examines the party and the wedding and um, the women's clothes and the happenings there and the love um, that's going on there between, between a man and a woman. All this is kind of, you know, okay, yeah, it seems like a woman's writing this story. So let's start. We're going to start, and I'm going to kind of go through the chapters really quick, and you can um, answer the questions in your book as you read through. When you're reading through, you're going to know uh, as you go through that her her writing is very flowery. Her writing is very um, English and, and foci focusing on, on England, but it's also a very sweet. And we'll find later on about Marianne's life, how she started, you know, um, giving her life to the Lord. And then as she went away from the Lord, what happened with her gaining all this money and um, coming into power and going back towards the end of her life. And she wrote Silas Marner at the end of her life. So let's start. Let's start with Silas Marner. It starts off um, with the spinning wheel and how, how they used the spinning wheel to make linens and clothing in that day. And talking about a weaver, a, a specific weaver that came into the city here. And they're wondering, is this weaver that weaves and, and spins the clothing, is he good or is he evil? And you can see the picture of um, of him spinning at a spinning wheel, like a spider spinning his web. So at first you think, okay, this, this guy is a spooky, spooky um, person coming into town. But we see them looking at him like an, an alien, a wandering man. He's very isolated or marginalized. That's the word marginalized. He's at the margins um, of the town and um, very vague and mysterious. And then it skips from that point to um, Revelo. Revelo is this town in the 1700s in which Silas Martyr becomes a part of. Um, it's in England, we know that, and it's in the England, um, the, the the England where you would think of where Robin Hood would be, you know, um, that that area uh, of how the people were, the plain, the peasants and the farmers and, and you know, meeting together in these small towns. That was Revenlo. And we're going to talk about Revenlo. And what year does this take place? In the 1700s. And so we look there and we see Silas Marner. And he's in his stone cottage. And the children are coming there. And uh, it says they were like scoundrels, kind of mocking him, thinking he was a spooky, spooky man. And also knowing that he would go out and he could um he would gather herbs so when they thought of herbs they thought of is this is this person you know is this person into demonic activities or what you know is he in the devil's business hmm well Revenlow as Revenlow um this merry england it goes in as she goes in and she she starts describing the parts of Revelo. Um, first of all, we have, you know, all these people looking at him, but now we look at this little town. And you'll see that it had a fine old church there that's been there for uh, many years. And um, 15 years, Silas had, we go, it goes ahead about 15 years that Silas had come there. So he'd been wandering around like this ghostly fig figure for 15 years. 
and they had a, a major place where the, where the men especially would gather, and that was called the Rainbow Lodge. And they'd ga gather to gossip and, of course, have their beers and, and talk about things going on in Arevalo. This Rainbow Lodge um, bar um, basically um, uh, was is where they would describe things like um, Marner, like Silas Marner. And they would say, oh man, he's, and they started talking about him, about a ghostly figure of a man. And that's where he got labeled as um, this dead man walking. And we have Lem Rodney, who's a mole catcher, catching moles, you know, talking about Silas Marner, that he saw him, that he was like a dead man, um, because he saw him sitting pla someplace and he just went into this fit, like a epileptic type fit where he looked like he was he was completely dead and he said I shook him and I shook him and he didn't even answer um, for a time period so then them thinking oh Silas Marner must be like uh, this Halloween person walking around the walking dead and so they sit there and talk and and they talk about how his soul must have came loosed from his body and how he um, did these herbs and charms that he must be somewhat demonic and even how he cured Sally Oates's heart. So he found these herbs, which later on we say is basically digitoxin, which is a, a, a heart medicine. But he but he found this herb and gave it to her and she, and she got better. So they're thinking, oh, who is Silas Marner? And of course, there he is weaving. The only thing he's doing day after day is weaving and weaving and spinning at his spinning hip wheel. And the whole time, though, he's spinning these magnificent cloths. And the women are coming, knocking on his door, paying him in gold for this the magnificent cloths and the magnificent clothing and uh, these things that he's he is um, weaving. So he is making a lot of money. And what happens then? Well, we'll tell you in just a little bit. But the, the history of Silas Marner, when we see it is a unique history because we're told something about him. It goes back to why is he there at Ravenlow? Hmm? Why is he there? Well, it talks about a metamorphosis time. What happens in metamorphosis is like, you know, when a, a caterpillar goes into a cocoon, that this was his cocoon period. Hey, it, sometimes in our lives, don't we have this period of cocoon where we, we go someplace new and we had a past and that caterpillar like past, but, but that God brings us into that cocoon and he brings us out like a butterfly. It's just a hint of what's going to happen to Silas Marner. So we, we learn about his past and his past being quite uh, significant. Let's see. What about this ghostly figure's past? First, um, he came from a place called Lantern Yard, which we see is probably on the coast and probably where they lived close together because it definitely was not a farming town. And he lived an exemplary life, it says. That means he was a good guy, you know. And he had faith in God, ardent faith in God, and believed in God with all his heart. Um, but one time, what happened? At his prayer meeting at the chaplain, a chaplaincy there, he fell over and he started going into this fit, they called. Probably epilepsy. At that time, they didn't know. They thought, well, epileptics had demonic spirits, which of course we know is not true, but right during the prayer meeting. So at these prayer, at this prayer meeting, having this fit, um, they kind of labeled him like, oh, he's kind of different. Um, I don't know if he's really of God, is he? So the people looked at him and frowned. So it was a cult-like experience um, of, a, of a chapel where he lived, we find. And um, we know that um, Silas was sane and he was honest. And, you know, he, but he did get into, because his mother did a lot of medicine herbs. And again, he was labeled um, as, as, as more than um, a supernatural um, type um, and more than um, more than possibly, you know, that witchcraft um, in his, his past, which was not there. 
but his friend at that time and he, he and of course Silas he had a great friend and his name his friend's name was William Dane and he was a little bit older they called the two of them as they walked through like David and Jonathan and they talked about subjects like assurance of salvations and making your calling election um, sure and so they they talked a lot of evangelical things and Silas was engaged to a servant girl there named Sarah. And he was waiting and he loved Sarah and he was waiting to be married and to be married in the church. Well, when Silas had that fit at church, when he had that epileptic seizure, um, they, they, uh, they, he thought that Sarah would never marry him. Yet Sarah still um still thought Silas was a good good guy. And of course, she still wanted to marry him. So that fit didn't really, that seizure didn't really affect her much. But then we have William, his best friend, and um, William basically thinking Silas was, you know, I'll use this, this fit. Because we find out later on that William was jealous of Silas, and he really wanted Silas's fiance, his girl. And we'll see how evil this becomes, trying to take away um, his girl. And so we go on and we see Silas. So what happens with Silas? Another thing. One of the deacons became very sick and was dying. And so they had a night watch of the deacons at the church. And Silas and William were scheduled to watch. One, you know, earlier, probably Silas around 2, you know, at, um, midnight to like 2 a.m. And later on, we have William taking over. Well, Silas went into watching, and what happened? Silas had another one of those fits. He can't remember that he lost time during that night. And when he awoke up, we find that the deacon had died. And so, of course, Silas goes and he wonders, and he sees the time. He wonders why William hasn't come because he was supposed to come. And later on, William says, well, I didn't come because I wasn't feeling too well. I was sick. What you find out later on was a lie. And so, uh, um, so basically, uh, what what the deal was? Well, they they didn't you know say anything to Silas except that the deacon had um, in an area where you'd have to uh, an area like a I'd say a bureau drawer that was that was shut. Uh, they had um, a, some a bag of money, and in that drawer, they looked. The bag of money was gone. And what was in that, what was left in place that had cut that loose, that bag of money, was a knife. And whose knife was it? It was Silas's knife. Silas said he didn't do this. He didn't steal the money, that, that he didn't know how his knife got there, but nobody would believe them. And then William says, look, I found the empty bag without the money tucked away in Silas's bedchamber. Silas like, what? What? What William, knowing that William was lying and basically saying, ah, um, William, you're the one that did this. You're the one that stole the money. And of course, um, no one would believe it. They all thought Silas was lying. So instead of examining the whole situation or bringing it to the law, the church basically said, let's draw lots straws so whoever gets you or him whoever gets the short straw is the one that's lying well in that way we think it was pretty rigged as they might have been both short straws but i don't know but we see the drawing of the straws didn't work um the drawing of lots basically was saying that that um silas had stolen the money when he hadn't so Silas feeling, well, what is God? Is God the one that's basically, um, God, God has given me drawing at the lots and that God has put me as a liar. I did not steal that money. And he took, he told William last time that I used that knife, William, you had my knife, you stole the money. And then he said, basically saying there is no just God that governs righteously. God is a God of lies and bears against the innocent. And Silas had lost his faith in the church, lost his faith in his friend, lost his faith in God. The people said blasphemy when he said this, and then they wanted him to leave. And he said, you must be the voice of Satan to, to Silas Marner. 
So my, Silas Marner's uh, trust had been shaken. And then he thought, she will cast me out. The love of my life, my fiance, Sarah, I'm surely she's not going to marry me now. And she did not, of course. And we find one month later, Sarah was married to William Dunn, Silas's friend. So Silas left town and took his, took his weaving, took, took his spinning wheel, left in a cart, went on to the town of Revelo from Lantern. And he, as he comes into Revelo, he, he becomes this ghostly figure, not wanting to talk to anyone, not trusting anyone, not trusting God, just making his money. And that's what we find in the, the next chapters to come. So the women, of course, they were wanting these new linens. And Mrs. Osgood, of course, and we see all the way through, we see all these characters coming alive in Revenlo and, and see how the characters turn towards Silas and what happens to Silas in Revenlo. Um, but anyway, the it says the loveless chasms of a Marner's life but here he was spinning his wheel and no one, he thought, no one cared. Now, so what becomes the love of his life and replaces his love for Sarah? Uh, money. He starts getting the money and as the money came, the gold and the guineas and everything, he drew out his money and every night he would count his money and how much he loved it. So every night, count and looking at his money, looking at his riches, looking at his gold and then hiding it below in, in um, a hole, a basic hole in the cobblestones there. And go so going on from that, we see, you know, Silas's, of course, his money, money situation that he had fallen in love of money. Uh, and he worked 16 hours a day of the hard money year after year making this money. He had not yet turned 40, but, you know, he had started looking old from all the stress of what he had gone through. And and he had stayed away from everyone. Everyone called him Old Master Marner, although he wasn't that old. And so here he is, 15 years at Revenlo, and every night um, bathing his hands in his money, thinking how much money I have. And he was pretty wealthy, you can imagine, saving every cent that he had. So we go on to the 15th year at Christmas. And this is what we got to chapter three already, but we're going to go through these next chapters pretty fast. But these first chapters kind of set the stage. Here at Revenlo, Silas Marner's life is very sad, and he indeed is in a cocoon. But we have all these people looking at him, and what shall happen next? <laughs>